Hello everyone, um, my name is Mindovas Mazuras and today I'm going to talk about engineering for engineering's sake. In the case you want to find me on the web after the presentation, here's where you can find me. That's my GitHub, Twitter, and sometimes I blog on codingfearlessly.com. Here's a photo of me. That in the background is me, if you can see it. Uh, and this is the office of the company that I work for. This is Vinted. I've started at Vinted more than four years ago as a software developer, and today I lead engineering. Uh, Vinted is on a mission to make secondhand the first choice worldwide. To make that a reality, we're building an e-commerce platform uh, for pre-loved fashion. We're based in Vilnius. That's where I come from. And we have more than 12 million users worldwide, um, and, and we're backed with 60 million euros by Excel Insight and Hubert Borda Media. In the four years that I've been with Vinted, starting as one of the first engineers, uh, I've learned quite a lot. And one of those things that I've learned, I want to share today with you by talking about engineering for, for engineering's sake. I'll do that in three parts. The first part will be about why I love engineering, why I think that engineering is fun. In the second part, I'll tell you a story about something that happened at Vinted. And in the third part, I'll try to draw some conclusions from the from aforementioned story. So let's start. Uh, first thing. So, oh, sorry. First thing, who of you have ever written code in your life? <laughs> That's all of you, right? And who of you are software developers? I think all of you too. So that's great. I think that you probably understand the sentiment uh, that software engineering is fun. I hope that you do. Uh, for me, software engineering is a lot of fun. It's something that I enjoy quite a lot. And my journey towards software engineering started at a pretty early age. The first computers that I encountered were not PCs or made by Apple. They were gaming systems. Gaming systems that you probably don't, don't recognize. Uh, that's a Zilliton. Any of you heard this name before? <laughs> oh, there is someone who heard of Zilliton before. Amazing. Uh, so if you had a Sega Genesis, this looks kind of familiar, doesn't it? <laughs> It's a hardware clone uh, made in China that was quite popular in a couple of countries, including Lithuania. Uh, it looks completely like Sega Genesis, except the cartridge is completely different. So no one in Lithuania had uh, uh, NES or Sega Genesis. We had stuff like that, Zillitons. And our family didn't have a gaming system. Uh, and I've, I've encountered these when visiting friends uh, and, and uh, gamed on these. The first real computer, uh, one that has a keyboard and a mouse, I've encountered in my father's office. My father used to take me there, and I would plop there in front of a computer and spend time Gaming. I, rem I remember only uh, one name of a game, and that's Magic Carpet. Exploring the file system itself was also kind of a game for someone who knew almost no English words. Finding the game that I want to play was a challenge unto itself. Um, I would spend as much time as possible uh, playing around on that computer. When one visit would be over, I would immediately await the next one. Eventually, we got a computer at home. It was meant for learning and doing work, uh, but uh, somehow it ended, it ended up in mine and my brother's room. And 
if you know kids, a computer that's uh, safely put in the, ch in the children's room will not be used for learning much. We spend a lot of it, a lot of time on it, just gaming. One time, um, my father locked that computer with a password, and I hacked it. And by hacked it, I mean that I spent a couple of hours brute forcing I, until I guessed the password. <laughs> now, if I were smart, I would have not told it to, to anyone except my brother, but I had to immediately brag about it afterwards. <laughs> um, so when it came time for me to decide what am I going to study? What, how will my career look like? You would think that it was an easy choice, that I picked software engineering just like that. But it wasn't. I was having too much, too much fun on the computer. Uh, when the whole internet thing happened, I discovered software development, and I started learning Pascal, and that was a lot of fun, but, I, but because it was a lot of fun, I did not consider it as something that I can make a career out of. Luckily, luckily, I had a friend. I had a friend who was dead set on software engineering, and his example helped me. Uh, when I discovered that he's really serious about the software engineering business, I had to go, oh, Wait, wait, wait a second. This is something that I can really do? People will pay me money to f sit in front of a computer all day? Like, this is, this is real? Uh, after that, it, it was an easy choice. So I ended up studying software engineering in, in, at Vilnius University and eventually became a software engineer. There's another photo of me. That's me, hard at work, uh, trying to figure out that problem. The secret is, is that software engineering at, at work is not always fun, even at Vinted. Sometimes we have to work on projects that are not exciting or interesting. Projects that require us to solve problems that we solved many times before, and it's not interesting to solve the same problem over and over again. Projects that we maybe don't believe in, um, but everyone else does, so we have to work on that project. But you know, where, where software engineering is always fun is at home. Because at home, I get to choose everything. I make all the choices. I, I choose the project, uh, I choose the deadline, and I choose the technologies. I'm the boss. Please don't say to my girlfriend that I said the sentence. So, and I can, I can choose to not do software engineering. I can choose to play some retro games like Castlevania Bloodlines. By the way, that was a really fun evening. And I can choose Final Fantasy IX. Have any of you played Final Fantasy IX? Yes, I'm among my people. Uh, so Final Fantasy IX is amazing. It, it is. I've spent hundreds of hours playing Final Fantasy IX in my life so far. And I will probably spend hundreds of hours more. There's even a version of Final Fantasy IX for iOS, so I could be playing it on my phone. It was released a couple of years ago, but I have not installed it yet because I'm just too afraid of what it will do to my productivity. So whenever I choose a project, whenever I choose a project to do at home, uh, to spend my time on, that project has to be more fun than Final Fantasy IX. Because that's the benchmark. That's like so. A lot of a lot of what makes software development fun is the technologies that we use, the technologies that we choose for the for the projects. So let's 
let's say I start a new project. Uh, will I pick PHP and PostgreSQL? And both of these are fine. PHP is fine, PostgreSQL is fine, but also boring. So I will not pick this. Uh, let's look at something else. Uh, what about Ruby, Rails, MySQL, and Backbone? Backbone. What about this technology stack? This is the technology stack that I've used for um, years at Vinted. This is the technology stack that I'm, that I'm very familiar with, that I know inside out, which makes it also boring. So it, I will also not pick this technology stack. What about Elixir? Phoenix, or think they be in React. Elixir, Phoenix. Even the names sound more exciting. I mean, Phoenix. Uh, let's all use Phoenix more. I want to say this wor word more often. These are shiny and new and interesting and something that I have not spent hundreds of, uh, hundreds of hours playing around with. So this is the technology stack that I, that, I, that I would pick for a new project. Because I can be a, I can be a magpie. Uh, I like shiny, new. I love to play around with technologies, tinker with them, figure them out, see what they are capable, capable of. I love to do engineering for engineering's sake. Because that's what it, that's what it is. I, I don't pick Elixir Phoenix because uh, they're the best tools for the job. I pick them because they're shiny and new and uh, I would like to play around with them. I think that's fine. And I bring the same mindset to work. At least I used to. So at my first job, I worked at a very small company, less than a dozen people, and we used ASP.NET Web Forms for our web applications. At home, in the evenings, I was playing around with ASP.NET MVC. Everyone, or at least uh, people that I follow, uh, was talking about ASP.NET MVC. ASP.NET was new and shiny and bound to take over the world. Uh, people were uh, talking about how it's a better way to do things. Some of the people are here at this conference doing other presentations. Um, and I tried, tried out ASP.NET MVC myself, and I was convinced it is, it is the better way. So uh, when, when it came time for a new project, uh, I've, I've tried to convince everyone that we should use ASP.NET MVC this time instead of ASP.NET Web Forms. And I've spent hours and hours discussing it, and I, eventually I did convince everyone. We ended up using ASP.NET MVC, and for that project and for all the other projects that came afterwards. As a second company that I worked for, now a bigger company, uh, at the time that I was there it was between close to 200 people. We were using SVN for source control. I was not using SVN at home. I was using Git. Git was new and shiny and everyone was talking about it. And I believed that it's, it's the better way. So, I was also using uh, SVN Git Bridge at work, which allowed me to use Git locally, uh, but still push to the 
main SVN repository. But it was not enough. I've had to convince the whole company to switch from SVN to Git. So I prepared a presentation. I did that presentation once, then two more times for other parts of the company. I also repeated that presentation in the local user group and at the local conference. And I've spent hours and hours trying to convince the whole company that we should switch from SVN to Git. And eventually, uh, I got the permission to set up a Git server, which I did in, on my own free time. And we, our team got the permission to try out Git. And we did, successfully. And the whole company switched from SVN to Git. In both of those, in, in both of the, these cases, uh, my primary motivator was not, uh, was not was not was not that Git was uh, somehow empirically better than SVN, or that ASP.NET MVC was empirically better than ASP.NET Web Forms. In both of those cases, I've spent hours and hours trying to convince everyone because uh, Git was new, because SP.NET MVC was shiny because the community was talking about these, 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 and because they were exciting. And now I came to believe that that might not be the best mindset to bring to work. And, what, and I want to share with you another story. And I call this story Redising Feed. This is something that happened at Vinted. Uh, it was 2013, and there was this peer-to-peer uh, -peer marketplace that wanted to build a feed. And this is Vinted we're talking about here. And yeah, we wanted to build a feed. And you all probably know what a feed is. There's a feed on GitHub, on Twitter, on Facebook. And we wanted to build something similar because we believed that it will make our members happy and it will increase sales. So we came up uh, with these requirements. We wanted our feed to have picks. That means content picked by our moderators as the best that should be seen by everyone. We also wanted our feed to have content by by brands and members that you follow. And we also wanted to make suggestions in the feed ab about what kind of brands and members you should follow next. So these were the product requirements. And the development team, including me, sat down and got to thinking, how do we build a feed? Because none of us at that time, have built a feed before. This was, this was new. This was interesting. So we looked at the requirements, and we got to researching. Because there, are, there were other companies, even at that time, who built feeds. We looked at what Facebook has done, Twitter, Instagram, everyone. We looked at... Uh, uh, what kind of open source uh, libraries and tools are available? available. We, took a, we took our time trying to figure it out. And we ended up, among other things, uh, picking Redis. We decided that Redis is perfect. Redis has this, um, this sorted set feature which is basically meant for a feed, because that's what a feed is. A feed is a sorted set of things. So we picked Redis. Um, and we looked at uh, what kind of other technologies we're using. And we had MySQL as our primary data store, 
and memcached or caching. And we thought, huh, does it make to make sense to add Redis here? Yeah, 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 it does. Let's add Redis to this technology stack. And then we got to building. And we built the feed successfully in a couple of months, I think. Uh, we deployed it. We ran a couple of A-B tests, which these have shown that members do actually like using the feed. And then we released it to everyone. And yeah, our members were happy. Uh, they were happy about this new feature that we shipped and they were actually using our product more and this led to increased sales. So everyone wins. Not so fast. What about engineers? We, including me, uh, had the chance to build something new, something that we've never built before, a feed. We, actually, we also had a chance to use Redis, a technology that none of us at that time were familiar with. So that's, that's two wins, right? That makes software engineers happy. There was one problem, though. Um, this issue called peak technical depth. Um, yeah. The thing is, while it's called feed technical depth, it might as well be called Redis technical depth. Because almost all the issues listed in that topic, in that issue, are somehow related to Redis. Um, those issues include stuff like, well, so we knew that Redis stores everything in RAM, but we didn't actually spend time trying, trying to figure out how much RAM we'll, we will actually need. Um, and at first it was okay, but then we understood that for feed to be really uh, successful, we need to increase the length of uh, each user's feed twofold. And that led us to scrambling, trying, uh, uh, trying to rent more servers. Because we host on-premise, so we didn't have the ability to just pop up more machines in the cloud. We, ha we actually needed to uh, order those machines and, wa and wait for those machines to arrive. Also, Redis at that time had no solutions for high availability. Redis cluster and Redis Sentinel were not a thing. So we didn't really have a way to make Redis highly available. And because uh, Redis was our only store for storing uh, feed, we wanted to back that up. And to back that up, we decided that we'll just save, save everything to disk every 30 minutes. And that means forking, and that means we had a bunch of errors every 30 minutes. And all these things are solvable, and we did end up solving them. It just took a while. So this issue was opened in March 2014. Uh, Anyone wants to take a guess when it was closed? <laughs> Still open is a good guess. <laughs> um, it, was actually, it was actually closed in September 2015, a uh, year and a half later. It was closed after we migrated to Redis cluster and made, made, it, made our setup highly available. So this is Kind of a, a, a kind of a success story, but not really. Uh, let me share with you another story. Uh, let's go back even further to 2010. 
there was this company, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, marketplace, and they wanted to build a feed. And this company is Etsy. Uh, in 2010, they also wanted to build a feed. And their requirements were quite similar to ours. And they also got to thinking, and this is, I'm telling you this because I later read it all in their blog post, and they also got to thinking, how do we do that? Because at that time, they also never built a feed. And they also looked at Redis. Um, and then they looked at their technology stack and thought, does this make sense? Huh. No, it doesn't. They decided that it doesn't make sense, and instead, they chose just to use Memcached. So Memcached is not a perfect, uh, not a perfect fit in this case because memcached only has uh, simple keys and values. So what they did is they uh, had a feed dash user ID as a key, and they stored the whole feed as a value, serialized. And they shipped it that way. They also ran A-B tests, etc., and their members were quite happy about the result. And engineers? Engineers just moved on to working on some other stuff. While we were trying to figure out Redis and solving all the problems that we couldn't foresee, in their case, you just moved on to something else. So these are the two stories, ours and Etsy's. In our case, we chose Redis, and in their case, they chose Memcached. And I think that there are two aspects that need to be discussed when making these kinds of choices. One of them is shininess, the other is stack. And let's start with shininess. In our case, we chose a technology that at that time, was quite new and exciting. They chose something that's old and boring. Um, how to make these? Uh, hmm. What what do we need to look at to make these kind of choices? What about trends? So let's let's take GoLang. GoLang is trending upwards. Doing great. Ruby, for example, is staying about at the same level. And PHP is trending downwards. So does, does that mean that we should pick Golang and should never pick PHP? Well, not, not really. Because context matters. And the context is this. While Golang is gaining popularity, it's nowhere near PHP. So we picked a technology that was written, that was created in 2009. And it's picked uh, for feed to use something that's for now 14 years old, like really old in technology terms. And with that, old, with that oldness and borgness comes a couple of things. One is tools. So when a technology had the time to be accepted, to build up a community around, around it, uh, to, build, to build a community around itself, that, that community or those companies create various kinds of tools for that technology. We had multiple cases with Redis when we had to write something ourselves. 
Uh, in one case, we looked for a data migration tool for the problem that we had. We couldn't find anything, so we wrote it ourselves in Ruby. Another thing is information. And I'm just and I'm not talking just about documentation. There are all sorts of information available about, about memcached that you probably could not find about Redis. And I'm talking primarily about information about real world usage. Problems that real people and real companies have encountered uh, when trying to use a technology. There were multiple cases when we had a problem, uh, we wanted to solve it really fast, we went on Stack Overflow, we put in, uh, we wrote, a, we wrote something, we wrote our problems, in, we wrote our problem into the search box, and we found nothing. And then we had to figure it out ourselves. Maybe someone else has en did encounter that problem before, but did not decide to share it. Uh, we'll never know. But we, but we did need to struggle and figure, it, figure those problems out ourselves. So sometimes it's a good idea to let bigger companies uh, take care of those problems. Companies like Google, Microsoft, Facebook, Amazon, those companies do encounter engineering problems that require to use or sometimes even create new technologies. In most of our cases, uh, at least, in, and at least in all the cases that I've encountered so far as software engineer, uh, the problem could have could be could be solved by something that was written uh, quite a long time ago in technology terms. So that was about shininess. Uh, another thing is, the second part of it is stack. So we chose a technology, that is, that was new to our stack. Etsy chose something that was already part of their stack. And with that, uh, they chose something that they had a lot of knowledge about already we chose something that we had no knowledge about. And that's, that's fine, learning is good, but the frustration comes when uh, someone not on your team encounters, uh, encounters your technology choice. So at least most of my frustration uh, when I uh, dig into some code that I've never dug into before comes from not bad choices. There are rarely bad choices. People are not evil, they're not, they are not trying to do it in a bad way. They come beca because of different choices. And when you want to do something uh, quickly, when you want to solve the problem quickly, that different uh, can get in, t in your way. And you don't really want to spend the time to acquire that knowledge about, the, about a different way that someone decided to solve that, that problem. Because we chose Redis, we also created some new kinds of discussions. So we, already, we had both Redis and Memcached as part of our stack. So there were multiple times when we had new problems where we had discussions about, huh, which one should we use, Redis or Memcached? And those are fine discussions, but they're not very productive. We also, when we chose Redis, 
did not consider, consider this whole thing called operations. We didn't consider that we'll need to set up logging and monitoring, and we'll actually need to make sure that somehow Redis will end up in production and be highly available. We didn't consider all these things. We also didn't consider that by increasing the amount of uh, technologies we have in our stack, uh, we, we are creating work for the, fu uh, for the future. Because the bigger our stack is, the more operational stuff we'll need to take care of in the future too. And also, at one point in time, we considered building V2.0. We had some new product requirements, and we got to thinking, how do we build this? Huh? Hmm. Let's see. And this architecture has no Redis in it. It's, it's nowhere to be found. So all that work that we put into Redis to be our store for feed would have been for naught. We would have, if we didn't actually decide to build V2.0, but if we would have, would have, we would have also thrown away Redis because we would not have used it anymore. So the idea here is that um, I don't really want to add more stuff to my, to my technology stack unless I really, really, really need it. Because most of the problems can be solved with the technolo with technologies that, I that we already have in our stacks. Hmm, so yeah. If, uh, if I were, could go back in time and make this choice again, I would most likely make the same choice that Etsy did or at least try to convince everyone to make the same choice that Etsy did, to pick Memcached instead of Redis. While it's not a perfect fit, it's, uh, it's a better fit if you want to ship something. So what I've learned is that shipping is fun. And maybe I should use the word not learned, but recognized, because when I look back into my childhood and when I was playing around with a scale programming language and uh, writing simple console applications, uh, I remember how excited I would be to show off what I've written. I would take that simple console application and I would show it to everyone that would be interested in seeing it primarily my brother and my mother. And yeah, so, so even then shipping would be, shipping something and creating something would lead to a lot of joy and excitement for me. Also, when I look back at various projects that I've done in my own spare time or, or open source projects, the moments that I remember or the projects that I remember have nothing to do with Phoenix, alas. Um, I remember moments like when I got onto Twitter and I've noticed that someone in Japan actually used an open source library that I wrote. Someone in Japan did a presentation about something that I've written and, and, they're use, and they used and they wanted it to share with everyone. This is a moment that I remember very distinctly because I, could, I was jumping for joy for at least a couple of minutes after I've noticed that. So I came to recognize that shipping, shipping is, is more fun for me than just engineering for engineering's sake. I don't want to spend my time building these. This does not seem very useful. I mean, that's, that's grass. <laughs> this is not fire. 
I'm sure that engineers that built this bridge had a lot of fun, but uh, yeah, not something that I want to spend my time on. I came to recognize that while working with exciting tools and programming languages, uh, uh, gives a lot of fun. It's even more fun to actually uh, ship something exciting. And there, this, there is this phrase going around, the right tool for the job. And the phrase itself, it's completely fine, but uh, it's often misused to mean not the right tool, but the newest and most exciting tools, the tool that I want to use. I came to recognize that while engineering for engineering's sake is fun, it's, it's not what I want to spend most of my time on. Well, only some of, it, only some of my time. And I came away with... Uh, Two, two things that I try to consider whenever I make a technology choice. So one, one is I consider using something boring. Something that's been used hundreds of times before by, by thousands of people. Because, because boring works. In the, in the company context, I consider optimizing company-wide because decisions that I, ma that I make or you make inside of a team will affect someone else from another team eventually. So it's a good idea to, to consider optimizing company-wide and, ha for example, having a much smaller technology stack. And there are examples from Vinted's history that where we, I think, made the right choice. So at one point, we, we considered adding Hadoop to our stack um, because we thought we, need, we have a lot of data. So we need to, be, to, use, to create a big data stack and use all, this new big, all these big data technologies. But, but, think correctly, we decided against that. We decided to just keep everything in MySQL, create a replica, and do analysis on that replica. And that worked for a surprisingly, surprisingly long time. Much longer than we initially expected. So this is almost the last slide. And I know that this is not very exciting. <laughs> like, it's not. But uh, what is exciting, at least me, is, is shipping, creating something, something meaningful. Thanks for listening. <laughs> How do the questions work here? <laughs> Are there any? <laughs> I guess not. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everyone. <laughs>